Little Britain. What I write is most true. I have a whole book of cases lying by me which if I should settle forth, some grave ancients, within the hearing of Bobel, would be out of charity with me. Nash. In the centre of the great city of London lies a small neighbourhood, consisting of a cluster of narrow streets and courts, of very venerable and debilitated houses, which goes by the name of Little Britain. Christ Church School and St. Bartholomew's Hospital bounded on the west, Smithfield and Long Lane on the north, Aldersgate Street, like an arm of the sea, divides it from the eastern part of the city, whilst the yawning Gulf of Bull and Mouth Street separates it from Butcher Lane, and the regions of Newgate. Over this little territory, thus bounded and designated, the great dome of St. Paul's, swelling above the intervening houses of Paternoster Row, Amen Corner, and Ave Maria Lane, looks down with an air of motherly protection. This quarter derives its appellation from having been, in ancient times, the residence of the Dukes of Brittany. As London increased, however, rank and fashion rolled off to the west, and trade, creeping on at their heels, took possession of their deserted abodes. For some time Little Britain became the great mart of learning, and was peopled by the busy and prolific race of booksellers, these also gradually deserted it, and, emigrating beyond the great strait of Newgate Street, settled down in Paternoster Row and St. Paul's Churchyard, where they continue to increase and multiply even at the present day. But though thus falling into decline, Little Britain still bears traces of its former splendour. There are several houses ready to tumble down, the fronts of which are magnificently enriched with old oaken carvings of hideous faces, unknown birds, beasts, and fishes, and fruits and flowers which it would perplex a naturalist to classify. There are also, in Aldersgate Street, certain remains of what were once spacious and lordly family mansions, but which have in latter days been subdivided into several tenements. Here may often be found the family of a petty tradesman, with its trumpery furniture, burrowing among the relics of antiquated finery, in great, rambling, time-stained apartments, with fretted ceilings gilded cornices, and enormous marble fireplaces. The lanes and courts also contain many smaller houses, not on so grand a scale, but, like your small ancient gentry, sturdily maintaining their claims to equal antiquity. These have their gable ends to the street, great bow windows, with diamond panes set in lead, grotesque carvings, and low arched doorways. In this most venerable and sheltered little nest have I passed several quiet years of existence, comfortably lodged in the second floor of one of the smallest but oldest edifices. My sitting room is an old wainscoted chamber, with small panels, and set off with a miscellaneous array of furniture. I have a particular respect for three or four high-backed claw-footed chairs, covered with tarnished brocade, which bear the marks of having seen better days, and have doubtless figured in some of the old palaces of Little Britain. They seem to me to keep together, and to look down with sovereign contempt upon their leathern-bottomed neighbours, as I have seen decayed gentry carry a high head among the plebeian society with which they were reduced to associate. The whole front of my sitting room is taken up with a bow window, on the panes of which are recorded the names of previous occupants for many generations, mingled with scraps of very indifferent gentlemanlike poetry written in characters which I can scarcely decipher, and which extol the charms of many a beauty of Little Britain who has long, long since bloomed, faded, and passed away. As I am an idle personage, with no apparent occupation, and pay my bill regularly every week, I am looked upon as the only independent gentleman of the neighbourhood, and, being curious to learn the internal state of a community so apparently shut up within itself, I have managed to work my way into all the concerns and secrets of the place. Little Britain may truly be called the heart's core of the city, the stronghold of true John Bullism. It is a fragment of London as it was in its better days, with its antiquated folks and fashions. Here flourish in great preservation many of the holiday games and customs of yore. The inhabitants most religiously eat pancakes on Shrove Tuesday, hot cross buns on Good Friday, and roast goose at Michael Elmer's. They send love letters on Valentine's Day, burn the Pope on the 5th of November, and kiss all the girls under the mistletoe at Christmas. Roast beef and plum pudding are also held in superstitious veneration, and port and sherry maintain their grounds as the only true English wines, all others being considered vile, outlandish beverages. 
Little Britain has its long catalogue of city wonders, which its inhabitants consider the wonders of the world, such as the Great Bell of St. Paul's, which sours all the beer when it tolls, the figures that strike the hours at St. Dunstan's clock, the monument, the lions in the tower, and their wooden giants in Guildhall. They still believe in dreams and fortune-telling, and an old woman that lives in Bull and Mouth Street makes a tolerable subsistence by detecting stolen goods, and promising the girls good husbands. They are apt to be rendered uncomfortable by comets and eclipses, and if a dog howls dolefully at night, it is looked upon as a sure sign of a death in the place. There are even many ghost stories current, particularly concerning the old mansion houses, in several of which it is said strange sights are sometimes seen. Lords and ladies, the former in full-bottomed wigs, hanging sleeves, and swords, the latter in lappets, stays, hoops and brocade, have been seen walking up and down the great waste chambers, on moonlight nights, and are supposed to be the shades of the ancient proprietors in their court dresses. Little Britain has likewise its sages and great men. One of the most important of the former is a tall, dry old gentleman, of the name of Scrime, who keeps a small apothecary's shop. He has a cadaverous countenance, full of cavities and projections, with a brown circle round each eye, like a pair of horned spectacles. He is much thought of by the old women, who consider him a kind of conjurer because he has two of three stuffed alligators hanging up in his shop, and several snakes in bottles. He is a great reader of almanacs and newspapers, and is much given to pore over alarming accounts of plots, conspiracies, fires, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions, which last phenomena he considers as signs of the times. He has always some dismal tale of the kind to deal out to his customers, with their doses, and thus at the same time puts both soul and body into an uproar. He is a great believer in omens and predictions, and has the prophecies of Robert Nixon and Mother Shipton by heart. No man can make so much out of an eclipse, or even an unusually dark day, and he shook the tail of the last comet over the heads of his customers and disciples until they were nearly frightened out of their wits. He has lately got hold of a popular legend or prophecy, on which he has been unusually eloquent. There has been a saying current among the ancient sibyls, who treasure up these things, that when the grasshopper on the top of the exchange shook hands with the dragon on the top of Bow Church steeple, fearful events would take place. This strange conjunction, it seems, has as strangely come to pass. The same architect has been engaged lately on the repairs of the cupola of the exchange, and the steeple of Bow Church, and, fearful to relate, the dragon and the grasshopper actually lie, cheek by jowl, in the yard of his workshop. Others, as Mr. Scrime is accustomed to say, may go stargazing, and look for conjunctions in the heavens, but here is a conjunction on the earth, near at home, and under our own eyes, which surpasses all the signs and calculations of astrologers. Since these portentous weathercocks have thus laid their heads together, wonderful events had already occurred. The good old king, notwithstanding that he had lived eighty-two years, had all at once given up the ghost, another king had mounted the throne, a royal duke had died suddenly, comma, another, in France, had been murdered, there had been radical meetings in all parts of the kingdom, the bloody scenes at Manchester, the great plot of Cato Street, and above all, the queen had returned to England. All these sinister events are accounted by Mr. Scrime, with a mysterious look, and a dismal shake of the head, and being taken with his drugs, and associated in the minds of his auditors with stuffed sea monsters, bottled serpents, and his own visage, which is a title page of tribulation, they have spread great gloom through the minds of the people of Little Britain. They shake their heads whenever they go by about church, and observe that they never expected any good to come of taking down that steeple, which in old times told nothing but glad tidings, as the history of Whittington and his cat bears witness. The rival oracle of Little Britain is a substantial cheesemonger, who lives in a fragment of one of the old family mansions, and is as magnificently lodged as a round-bellied mite in the midst of one of his own Cheshires. Indeed, he is a man of no little standing and importance, and his renown extends through Huggin Lane, and Lad Lane, and even unto Aldermanbury. His opinion is very much taken in affairs of state, having read the Sunday papers for the last half century, together with the Gentleman's Magazine, Rapin's History of England, and the Naval Chronicle. 
his head is stored with invaluable maxims which have borne the test of time and use for centuries. It is his firm opinion that it is a moral impossible, so long as England is true to herself, that anything can shake her, and he has much to say on the subject of the national debt, which, somehow or other, he proves to be a great national bulwark and blessing. He passed the greater part of his life in the Polius of Little Britain, until of late years, when, having become rich, and grown into the dignity of a Sunday cane, he begins to take his pleasure and see the world. He has therefore made several excursions to Hampstead, Highgate, and other neighbouring towns, where he has passed whole afternoons in looking back upon the metropolis through a telescope, and endeavouring to descry the steeple of St. Bartholomew's. Not a stage coachman of Bull and Mouth Street but touches his hat as he passes, and he is considered quite a patron at the coach office of the Goose and Gridiron, St. Paul's Churchyard. His family have been very urgent for him to make an expedition to Margate, but he has great doubts of those new gimcracks, the steamboats, and indeed thinks himself too advanced in life to undertake sea voyages. Little Britain has occasionally its factions and divisions, and party spirit ran very high at one time in consequence of two rival burial societies being set up in the place. One held its meeting at the Swan and Horseshoe, and was patronized by the cheesemonger, the other at the Cock and Crown, under the auspices of the apothecary, it is needless to say that the latter was the most flourishing. I have passed an evening or two at each, and have acquired much valuable information, as to the best mode of being buried, the comparative merits of churchyards, together with divers hints on the subject of patent iron coffins. I have heard the question discussed in all its bearings as to the legality of prohibiting the latter on account of their durability. The feuds occasioned by these societies have happily died of late, but they were for a long time prevailing themes of controversy, the people of Little Britain being extremely solicitous of funereal honours and of lying comfortably in their graves. Besides these two funeral societies there is a third of quite a different caste, which tends to throw the sunshine of good humour over the whole neighbourhood. It meets once a week at a little old-fashioned house, kept by a jolly publican of the name of Wagstaff and bearing for insignia a resplendent half-moon, with a most seductive bunch of grapes. The old edifice is covered with inscriptions to catch the eye of the thirsty wayfarer, such as Truman, Hanbury, and Co.S. Entire, Wine, Rum, and Brandy Vaults, Old Tom, Rum, and Compounds, etc. This indeed has been a temple of Bacchus and Mummers from time immemorial. It has always been in the family of the Wagstaffs, so that its history is tolerably preserved by the present landlord. It was much frequented by the gallants and cavalieros of the reign of Elizabeth, and was looked into now and then by the wits of Charles II's day. But what Wagstaff principally prides himself upon is, that Henry VIII, in one of his nocturnal rambles, broke the head of one of his ancestors with his famous walking staff. This, however, is considered as a rather dubious and vainglorious boast of the landlord. The club which now holds its weekly sessions here goes by the name of the Roaring Lads of Little Britain. They abound in old catches, glaze, and choice stories, that are traditional in the place, and not to be met with in any other part of the metropolis. There is a madcap undertaker who is inimitable at a merry song, but the life of the club, and indeed the prime wit of Little Britain, is bully Wagstaff himself. His ancestors were all wags before him, and he has inherited with the inner large stock of songs and jokes which go with it from generation to generation as heirlooms. He is a dapper little fellow, with bandy legs and bot belly, a red face, with a moist, merry eye, and a little shock of grey hair behind. At the opening of every club night he is called in to sing his confession of faith, which is the famous old drinking trowel from Gamma Girton's Needle. He sings it, to be sure, with many variations, as he received it from his father's lips for it has been a standing favourite at the Half Moon and Bunch of Grapes ever since it was written, nay, he affirms that his predecessors have often had the honour of singing it before the nobility and gentry at Christmas mummeries, when Little Britain was in all its glory. It would do one's heart good to hear, on a club night, the shouts of merriment, the snatches of song, and now and then the choral bursts of half a dozen discordant voices, which issue from this jovial mansion. At such times the street is lined with listeners, who enjoy a delight equal to that of gazing into a confectioner's window, or snuffing up the steams of a cook's shop. 
There are two annual events which produce great stir and sensation in Little Britain, these are St. Bartholomew's Fair, and the Lord Mayor's Day. During the time of the fair, which is held in the adjoining regions of Smithfield, there is nothing going on but gossiping and gadding about. The late quiet streets of Little Britain are overrun with an eruption of strange figures and faces, every tavern is a scene of rout and revel. The fiddle and the song are heard from the tap room, morning, noon, and night and at each window may be seen some group of boon companions, with half-shut A's, hats on one side, pipe in mouth, and tankard in hand, fondling, and proposing, and singing maudlin songs over their liquor. Even the sober decorum of private families, which I must say is rigidly kept up at other times among my neighbours, is no proof against this saturnalia. There is no such thing as keeping maid servants within doors. Their brains are absolutely set madding with punch and the puppet show, the flying horses, Signor Polito, the fire eater, the celebrated Mr. Pop, and the Irish giant. The children, too, lavish all their holiday money in toys and gilt gingerbread, and fill the house with the Lilliputian din of drums, trumpets, and penny whistles. But the Lord Mayor's Day is the great anniversary. The Lord Mayor is looked up to by the inhabitants of Little Britain as the greatest potentate upon earth, his gilt coach with six horses as the summit of human splendour, and his procession, with all the sheriffs and aldermen in his train, as the grandest of earthly pageants. How they exult in the idea that the King himself dare not enter the city without first knocking at the gate of Temple Bar, and asking permission of the Lord Mayor, for if he did, heaven and earth. There is no knowing what might be the consequence. The man in armour, who rides before the Lord Mayor, and is the city champion, has orders to cut down everybody that offends against the dignity of the city, and then there is the little man with a velvet porringer on his head, who sits at the window of the state coach, and holds the city sword, as long as a pike star fods blood. If he once draws that sword, majesty itself is not safe. Under the protection of this mighty potentate, therefore, the good people of Little Britain sleep in peace. Temple Bar is an effectual barrier against all interior foes, and as to foreign invasion, the Lord Mayor has but to throw himself into the tower, call in the train bands, and put the standing army of beefeaters under arms, and he may bid defiance to the world. Thus wrapped up in its own concerns, its own habits, and its own opinions, Little Britain has long flourished as a sound heart to this great fungus metropolis. I have pleased myself with considering it as a chosen spot, where the principles of sturdy John Bullism were garnered up, like seed corn, to renew the national character, when it had run to waste and degeneracy. I have rejoiced also in the general spirit of harmony that prevailed throughout it, for though there might now and then be a few clashes of opinion between the adherents of the cheesemonger and the apothecary, and an occasional feud between the burial societies, yet these were but transient clouds, and soon passed away. The neighbours met with goodwill, parted with a shake of the hand, and never abused each other except behind their backs. I could give rare descriptions of snug junketing parties at which I have been present, where we played at all fours, Pope Joan, Tome Come Tickle Me, and other choice old games, and where we sometimes had a good old English country dance to the tune of Sir Roger de Coverley. Once a year, also, the neighbours would gather together, and go on a gypsy party to Epping Forest. It would have done any man's heart good to see the merriment that took place here as we banqueted on the grass under the trees. How we made the woods ring with bursts of laughter at the songs of Little Wagstaff and the Merry Undertaker. After dinner, too, the young folks would play at blind man's buff and hide and seek, and it was amusing to see them tangled among the briars, and to hear a fine romping girl now and then squeak from among the bushes. The elder folks would gather round the cheesemonger and the apothecary to hear them talk politics for they generally brought out a newspaper in their pockets, to pass away time in the country. They would now and then, to be sure, get a little warm in argument, but their disputes were always adjusted by reference to a worthy old umbrella maker, in a double chin, who, never exactly comprehending the subject, managed somehow or other to decide in favour of both parties. All empires, however, says some philosopher or historian, are doomed to changes and revolutions. Luxury and innovation creep in, factions arise, and families now and then spring up, whose ambition and intrigues throw the whole system into confusion. 
thus in latter days has the tranquility of little Britain been grievously disturbed, and its golden simplicity of manners threatened with total subversion by the aspiring family of a retired butcher. The family of the Lambs had long been among the most thriving and popular in the neighborhood. The Miss Lambs were the bells of Little Britain, and everybody was pleased when Old Lamb had made money enough to shut up shop, and put his name on a brass plate on his door. In an evil hour, however, one of the Miss Lambs had the honor of being a lady in attendance on the Lady Mayoress, at her grand annual ball, on which occasion she wore three towering ostrich feathers on her head. The family never got over it. They were immediately smitten with a passion for high life, set up a one-horse carriage, put a bit of gold lace round the errand boy's hat, and have been the talk and detestation of the whole neighborhood ever since. They could no longer be induced to play at Pope Joan or Blind Man's Buff. They could endure no dances but quadrilles, which nobody had ever heard of in Little Britain, and they took to reading novels, talking bad French, and playing upon the piano. Their brother, too, who had been articled to an attorney, set up for a dandy and a critic, characters hitherto unknown in these parts, and he confounded the worthy folks exceedingly by talking about Keane, the opera, and the Edinburgh Review. What was still worse, the Lambs gave a grand ball, to which they neglected to invite any of their old neighbors, but they had a great deal of genteel company from Theobald's Road, Red Lion Square, and other parts towards the west. There were several bow of their brother's acquaintance from Gray's Inn Lane and Hatton Garden, and not less than three aldermen's ladies with their daughters. This was not to be forgotten or forgiven. All Little Britain was in an uproar with the smacking of whips, the lashing of miserable horses, and the rattling and the jingling of hackney coaches. The gossips of the neighborhood might be seen popping their nightcaps out at every window, watching the crazy vehicles rumble by and there was a knot of virulent old cronies, that kept a lookout from a house just opposite the retired butchers, and scanned and criticized every one that knocked at the door. This dance was a cause of almost open war, and the whole neighborhood declared they would have nothing more to say to the lambs. It is true that Mrs. Lamb, when she had no engagements with her quality acquaintance, would give little humdrum tea junketings to some of her old cronies, quite, as she would say, in a friendly way and it is equally true that her invitations were always accepted, in spite of all previous vows to the contrary. Nay, the good ladies would sit and be delighted with the music of the Miss Lambs, who would condescend to strum an Irish melody for them on the piano, and they would listen with wonderful interest to Mrs. Lamb's anecdotes of Alderman Plunkett's family, of Port Sickenwood, and the Miss Timberlocks, the rich heiresses of Crutched Friars, but then they relieved their consciences, and averted the reproaches of their confederates, by canvassing at the next gossip in convocation everything that had passed, and pulling the lambs and their out all to pieces. The only one of the family that could not be made fashionable was the retired butcher himself. Honest Lamb, in spite of the meekness of his name, was a rough, hearty old fellow, with the voice of a lion, a head of black hair like a shoe brush, and a broad face mottled like his own beef. It was in vain that the daughters always spoke of him as the old gentleman, addressed him as papa, in tones of infinite softness, and endeavored to coax him into a dressing gown and slippers, and other gentlemanly habits. Do what they might, there was no keeping down the butcher. His sturdy nature would break through all their glozings. He had a hearty vulgar good humor that was irrepressible. His very jokes made his sensitive daughters shudder, and he persisted in wearing his blue cotton coat of a morning dining at two o'clock, and having a bit of sausage with his tea. He was doomed, however, to share the unpopularity of his family. He found his old comrades gradually growing cold and civil to him, no longer laughing at his jokes, and now and then throwing out a fling at some people, and a hint about quality binding. This both nettled and perplexed the honest butcher, and his wife and daughters, with the consummate policy of the shrewder sex, taking advantage of the circumstance at length prevailed upon him to give up his afternoon's pipe and tankard at Wagstaff's, to sit after dinner by himself, and take his pint of poor tail liquor he detested and to nod in his chair in solitary and dismal gentility. The Miss Lambs might now be seen flaunting along the streets in French bonnets, with unknown beau, and talking and laughing so loud that it distressed the nerves of every good lady within hearing. They even went so far as to attempt patronage and actually induced a French dancing master to set up in the neighborhood, but the worthy folks of Little Britain took fire at it, 
and did so persecute the poor Gaul that he was fain to pack up fiddle and dancing pumps, and decamp with such precipitation that he absolutely forgot to pay for his lodgings. I had flattered myself, at first, with the idea that all this fiery indignation on the part of the community was merely the overflowing of their zeal for good old English manners, and their horror of innovation, and I applauded the silent contempt they were so vociferous in expressing, for upstart pride, French fashions, and the mislams. But I grieve to say that I soon perceived the infection had taken hold, and that my neighbours, after condemning, were beginning to follow their example. I overheard my landlady importuning her husband to let their daughters have one quarter at French and music, and that they might take a few lessons in quadrille. I even saw, in the course of a few Sundays, no less than five French bonnets, precisely like those of the Miss Lambs, parading about Little Britain. I still had my hopes that all this folly would gradually die away, that the lambs might move out of the neighborhood, might die, or might run away with attorneys apprentices, and that quiet and simplicity might be again restored to the community. But unluckily a rival power arose. An opulent oilman died, and left a widow with a large jointure and a family of buxom daughters. The young ladies had long been repining in secret at the parsimony of a prudent father, which kept down all their elegant aspirings. Their ambition, being now no longer restrained, broke out into a blaze, and they openly took the field against the family of the butcher. It is true that the lambs, having had the first start, had naturally an advantage of them in the fashionable career. They could speak a little bad French, play the piano, dance quadrilles, and had formed high acquaintances, but the trotters were not to be distanced. When the lambs appeared with two feathers in their hats, the Miss Trotters mounted four, and of twice as fine colours. If the lambs gave a dance, the trotters were sure not to be behindhand, and though they might not boast of as good company, yet they had double the number, and were twice as merry. The whole community has at length divided itself into fashionable factions, under the banners of these two families. The old games of Pope Joan and Tom come tickle me are entirely discarded, there is no such thing as getting up an honest country dance, and on my attempting to kiss a young lady under the mistletoe last Christmas, I was indignantly repulsed, the Miss Lambs having pronounced it shocking vulgar. Bitter rivalry has also broken out as to the most fashionable part of Little Britain, the Lambs standing up for the dignity of the Cross Keys Square, and the Trotters for the vicinity of St. Bartholomew's. Thus is this little territory torn by factions and internal dissensions, like the great empire who name it bears, and what will be the result would puzzle the apothecary himself, with all his talent at prognostics, to determine, though I apprehend that it will terminate in the total downfall of genuine John Boyism. The immediate effects are extremely unpleasant to me. Being a single man, and, as I observed before, rather an idle good-for-nothing personage, I have been considered the only gentleman by profession in the place. I stand therefore in high favour with both parties, and have to hear all their cabinet councils and mutual backbitings. As I am too civil not to agree with the ladies on all occasions, I have committed myself most horribly with both parties, by abusing their opponents. I might manage to reconcile this to my conscience, which is a truly accommodating one, but I cannot to my apprehension if the lambs and trotters ever come to a reconciliation, and compare notes, I am ruined. I have determined, therefore, to beat a retreat in time, and am actually looking out for some other nest in this great city, where old English manners are still kept up, where French is neither eaten, drunk, danced, nor spoken, and where there are no fashionable families of retired tradesmen. This found, I will, like a veteran rat, hasten away before I have an old house about my ears, bid a long, though a sorrowful, adieu to my present abode, and leave the rival factions of the lambs and the trotters to divide the distracted empire of Little Britain.